the infinite love of the Father is an anointing ungent and the love of God can be felt in these hills in the firmament in the air and the elements visible to your eyes the loving care of God becomes known external things speak of internal realities and the power of nature is invocative of the power of the divine nature when nature is observed when men are alert to behold when their eyes are open we have seen through the years, fragmentarily, glimpses of the expanding horizons of men, and we have served in the cause of freedom and the magnification of the love of the infinite in the hearts of men. How grateful I am then this day to be able to stand here and speak to the people of this nation and world about the love of the Supreme One. It is certainly true that in many circles of outer sophistication it is not exactly popular to declare for the Divine One. But we are not concerned with outer points of knowledge having long since now ceased our requirement for human adulation. Our devotion and our dedication is to the real in man, to the magnification of the flames of divinity within his heart. My beloved wife, Nada Rayborn, and all of us who are tied to St. Germain's flame of freedom, our concern today for the people of this world with the magnification of the power of freedom's flame in their lives. It is quite remarkable what structuring of reality is inherent within one single atom. By a like token, it is also remarkable how that one human monad can contain so great a reservoir of the divine. True it is that men are prone to sell themselves short from a divine standpoint and cloak their outer and inner identities with a fraudulent mask of mortal imperfection. How readily individuals claim for themselves the garment of imperfection. How quickly they permit individuals to say, but you are so imperfect. We who understand the universal law are aware of the tremendous power that is generated by thoughts and feelings. We know that the difference between the master and the one individual yet unascended is often no more than a thought or a breath. The transformation of identity then is achieved by living within the consciousness of the flame. The flame is a vital manifestation of God's love. And men should welcome it, for it purifies the consciousness and opens up the doorway into invisible realm. Having had the marvelous opportunity of walking through the grand art galleries of Venus, I am able now to tell the people of this planet that the beauty that has been externalized here by the great artists of the past and the release of magnificent musical expressions 
with all subtlety and nuance is as nothing compared to that which God has prepared for you when you are able to commune with this blessed sister planet, your own beloved Venus or Hesper. It is a hopeful sign that in the past men of rugged nature outwardly and internal sensitivity were able to penetrate into the realms of light and bring forth a portion of the divine radiance in their great works. Modern so-called masters of art are far too frequently influenced by their contemporaries and the question of saleability. We have a situation where the marts of the world dictate to the artists what they shall produce, not the contrary. The artists of the world then become molded by the crassness and the libertinism of the captains of industry. The reverse should be true and the sensitive artist's soul should be free to roam the halls of the infinite love of God to behold in the etheric realm the beauty and perfection of cosmic law. How do you suppose that nature herself was able to find the thought matrices which she has used in constructing the manifold archetypes of the floral kingdom? All was through subtle attunement the high vibratory action of the mind and soul is the mind and soul roaming far from mortal pastures was able to enter into the nature of the divine. When the divine nature is understood a bit more by the men and women of this planet, the power of love will be amplified because the power of love is the bringer forth of the floral patterns and scents. The power of love is the creator in the domain of nature of ardor and beauty. Have you thought upon the nature of God, the ardent nature of God, manifest in the floral kingdom? Do you realize that the elementals fervently bring forth beauty? How wonderful it is then for men and women to be able to go and do likewise, to magnify the divine, to enter into the heart of a rose, to enter into the spirit that prompted the magnificent words, consider the lilies of the field, for they toil not, neither do they spin. Spiritual labor is the labor of divine love. It requires your attention, blessed ones, upon the law. Your physical bodies are temples of God. Your eyes are the crystals, the mirrors in which eternity reflects. Your brains and sensitive minds are also the inner mirrors behind the mirrors in which cosmic universality manifests. But your hearts are the mercy seat of God. There the Christ washes the feet of the weary traveler. There the tears of the prodigal son mingle with the eternal Father. There the heart becomes bathed with the liquidity of spiritual glistening manifestation. The purity of the white throne 
upon which blazes forth the threefold flame of love, wisdom, and power. I have walked in these mountain ranges surrounding your property in physical embodiment. I have joyed in the glory of God. I have conducted business in your own city of Denver. I have been esteemed of men and despised of men. I have sought the stone which the builders rejected. The same has become the chief cornerstone of my life. And it was intended in the beginning that every individual upon this planet, every son of God, should make the chief cornerstone of their lives to be the Christ in all of his beauty and magnificence. The world is quick to forget the meaning of spiritual graces and gifts, but long to remember the darkness and shames of others and themselves. I urge upon you then this day as a means to spiritual regeneration that you shall forsake the identifying of yourselves with those dark elements of your nature which would cause you to weep. I urge instead that you consider the mercy of God has deposited in the chalice of your life the drippings of the supreme flame that are able to consume on the instant those unwholesome qualities that ought never to have manifested. Now then, let us adorn the consciousness with the beauty and holiness of Almighty God. Let us pause to consider the state of consciousness of the Ascended Masters. Let us pause to consider the consciousness of the individual acting under the guidance of his divine self. What shall it profit a man if he shall obtain the whole world and lose his soul? The opportunities of God are manifoldly given each day into the hand of men. And the spirit of the great white brotherhood is an active, compassionate unit of cosmic grace which seeks to administer to the needs of man and to assist the powers of light in fulfilling immortal destiny. How shall we then continue to accept the vibratory actions of the students of the light which are less than perfection? We cannot, we dare not, we shall not. Therefore, we want you to understand that when you feel far from us, and consider that we are not with you. Look to yourself and see what is the state of your consciousness. What are you pondering upon? What are your fears? What are your palliations? Are you seeking to alleviate your feelings of regret by creating still other matters which also will bring regret? Is this the part of wisdom? Bow down then and acknowledge the divine within. Commit yourself and learn the spirit of commitment as a means to obtaining and retaining personal happiness. Personal happiness is a vehicle. It is like a grease that a little boy once spread upon the seat of his pants in order that he might slide better down a slide. And I remember the incident. I urge then upon you all a recognition of infinite love and compassion as tangible elements in your work. Far too frequently individuals consider only matter which they can examine with their hands, see with their eyes, 
hear the crackling of with their ears, and realize outwardly exist. We urge upon you to learn to handle the subtle nature of God, the subtle nature of Christ, the subtle nature of the Ascended Masters, and your own subtle nature. For your own subtle nature is a manifest power of eternal victory. It will bring you into communion with those masters that abide in the mountains of the world, with the angels from on high who commune with the sacred heart, with the realization that life is a dream of God and that in this dream there is no sordid element. That whensoever there is fear and shadow and shame and darkness and quaver, an individual is minutely or grossly out of tunement with God. We invoke then the spirit of life and reality. We invoke then a realization that life need not be a struggle, but a gentle acceptance that will mount in intensity until that power that man will garner is sufficient for all of his needs to correct every outer condition that needs correcting and to enable him to step through the veil into that side of life where we are and to behold the reality of the self. sign of the heart and the head and the hand to you on the cross of light we seal you in the presence of life we heal you flame of eternal substance reveals all that God and reality is speak of the universal majesty. I speak of the universal majesty through the monadic consciousness expanding and forever expanding. We start with a sapling, a tiny tree. The tree grows in the forest. As its years expand, its rings expand. This little tree we are aware of, and the little tree is aware of the forest around. Now we expand the consciousness to other forests, to other continents, 
to other lands, to other worlds, and to the farthest reaches of infinity. The awful majesty of the Creator, the majesty of the creative essence, the majesty of the interconnecting mind and consciousness should be grasped at least in minute portions by all, for it can give a very wonderful conveyance of universal motivation to the consciousness when awareness enables men to position themselves perspectively in time, space, and eternity. Forget not then to entertain those benign thoughts which will lift you in consciousness out of the relatively limited domain of the finite self into the realm of the infinite self. By so doing, you cross over. You enter in to a higher realm of light and you commune with the love of God. The love of God is in one way, unspeakable. It is the love of light for itself. For by light were all things made, and light was also the fire of the mind. Light was the fire of the mind that engendered perspective in all life, each segment connected with the whole. And thus, the Father's love was brought also into manifestation. For the flame of the mind was the golden flame of illumination, but the flame of the heart was the pink flame of universal love. The essence of a rose, the radiance of communion, a communion flowing out from the bush, from the blossom into space, to hallow space, the communion of the infinite, hallowing the finite, the extension of the arm of God into the universe, everywhere apparent and everywhere manifest. Now then, as we engage the teeth of our attention upon the rings of the trees, let us consider the finite blossom, the finite stalk, the finite manifestation. This is individuality. This is you. Through the years of your tenure in manifestation, you have created layer upon layer of substance, rings upon rings, expanding outward through the trunk of being. Now then, if within this trunk and this ring system, all had ever been benign and beautiful, there would be no need for purification. And therefore, as this messenger told you this morning, there are in the lives of men, in subconscious levels of thought and feeling, those qualities which are not benign and are not able to raise you. These require the fires of transmutation and the images, the montages of thought and feeling that enter into the character of humanity and not into the character of divinity must be changed. What God hath wrought must be enthroned within the consciousness and every jot and tittle of the law of man's being that is less than the stride of perfection must be altered by the divine consciousness and penetrated by the light. The darkened recesses of the mind and being must be entered by the spirit of the eternal God and the purification of that spirit, what it will produce as the flame of the universal mind cognizing only good and perfection enters into the consciousness is a most marvelous penetration of thought and feeling whereby individuals are raised into that wonderful state of God freedom where the mind in space 
is aware only of the beauty between the spaces. When you understand that, it means that the spaces between the rings of the memory chain are themselves devoid of any that will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, saith the Lord. The mountain of God is the mount of aspiration. It is the aspiring of man to be that which he sees. Man communes with God. He sees the Father image, the vastness of universality cast upon the screen of nature and via nature eye. He sees and beholds the beauty of all things which return to him by consciousness. And he is able to grasp this principle as the fire of his being. God is great, man is small, the small man may become the great God. The small manifestation of the great God may become the allness of all things. But only by a kinship with the divine, only by the radiation of the divine, not by subservience, albeit the outer self must serve even as Jacob did Laban to receive Leah and Rebekah. The outer self must serve its bondage unto the higher self in order to obtain its beneficence and all the good that God desires to express to each one. Men cannot accept that they are going to spring forth full-blown as a rose from the consciousness of God. They cannot expect it at all. They must understand that first must come forth the shoot through the earth. This is aspiration. Then the stalk must rise. And as the stalk rises and sways in the gentle breezes of the Holy Spirit, it comes to pass that from the stalk there is put forth the beginnings of the bud, and then the bud doth appear. And by and by the bud itself begins to unfold and opens, releasing into the atmosphere a creation of wondrous beauty and a perfumed essence which is the purpose of it all. Men suppose that the rose itself is the glowing image they must revere. And when I say that it is the perfume, I teach that it is the expansion of the individuality out of the rose of manifestation into the universe that contributes to the expansion of all life that is genuine expansion and genuine living. This is the more abundant life. It is the communion with the All-Father. The minute flower then becomes in the perfume blending with other perfumes the extravaganza of universal love. Everywhere dwelling, everywhere living, everywhere benefiting, and nowhere being recognized in the minute portion for its greatness, for only its greatness can be recognized by itself in totality, and because consciousness is dispersed, it is seldom that consciousness comes together in order to recognize and appraise its own greatness. And in very fact, it is seldom that the minute portions of its greatness themselves recognize the greatness even of themselves. They do not know or understand that which is actually resident within the force field of themselves, within their consciousness, within the folds of being of universal essence and universal virtue. The seed of God dwelling in man, the seed of God sprouting in man, aspirations, adeptship, rising, pulsing, living, the tingling of virtue that begins in man as the first faint origins of true love. Ah, what a wondrous thing it is to behold. The goddess Meru and I stand often in contemplation of the miracle wisdom of the cosmos before the great glowing, radiant, pulsating flame here in our retreat at Lake Titicaca 
and we are amazed at how this flame here in space and time can extend itself by the miracle of universal projection of consciousness essence to the entire universe. Not only the earth planet, but the universe, for wherever a flame of infinite proportions that is embodying the concepts of the universal God springs up, it dare not stop until it is gone and penetrated to the farthest reaches of space. This is the goal of each one, but who can view it? Who can know it? Who can understand it? For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, as St. Paul long ago declared. For it does not bring men to the feet of real being. How can the finite inherit the infinite? The answer so simple is, by becoming the infinite. How can the finite become the infinite? By yielding its fruit to the infinite tree. What is the meaning of this? Enigmatic? Yes, perhaps so, but charged and laden with the fullness of universal possibility. All finite things and manifestations are schoolrooms of compartmented consciousness and circles of learners moving through the cosmos that they may generate regeneration or be generated by regeneration or be generated or regenerated by regeneration. Words have little meaning unless those who hear them are able to define the full meaning. And here we deal with the meaning of the self, with a universal cosmic ontology. We are concerned with the nature of being, but we are concerned with it as God is. There are those today to whom the sacred name is seldom of import. It has become a curse word upon their lips, a thing to be played with, as a generator of fear in the consciousness of others. But we are here to speak of wisdom and love, and the wisdom of God is not only complacent when the soul is humble, but the wisdom of God is also dynamic. God's wisdom moves up the cycle of the wave from a seemingly static state of complacency and acceptance of that which manifests to a point where the dynamism of the universal becomes a frightful whirlwind of consciousness that actually whirls all things into activity to produce the fire and flush of the Holy Spirit in the blossom of manifestation. Men must understand the potential sweeping from zero upward to its full blooms state. They must understand it and the upsweep of it they must understand the yin and yang of being in themselves and recognize that their drives and libido is actually intended to be a drive toward universal love and toward the manifestation of universal purpose. How else can men live? Are they vegetables? Are they pebbles upon the beach? Are they merely calcinated substance layer upon layer without consciousness or purpose? They are living souls created in the universal image and intended to become all the beauty that God is. The pageant of the divine, the pageant of the universal, the architecture and structuring of this is a most magnificent thing within itself. For God geometrized, God created, God structured, and his structuring was not a passive activity, but an active activity. The passive phase of that activity existed long before manifestation. For God foreknew from the beginning all things and did create the far-flung worlds and the far-flung universe in order to provide an expansion of himself in a beautiful givingness of himself to life. 
God is life. He has given himself to himself, but he has created beings to share his universe with. He has endowed them with the self-same graces and gifts which are his own, and has only held back their hand of creativity when it has approached the realm of danger whereby destruction and despair could manifest. And therefore this planet, under its present status of quarantine, and its warlike attitudes continues to express a cosmopolite destruction, a universal destruction among its people as the result of the waning of the power of love and the increasing of the power of selfishness and a failure and breakdown in understanding. For the universities of the world today are producing the phenomena of rebellion and unrest among the student body. There is knowledge, there is chaos. All over the world, the fruit of knowledge, of the mundane knowledge of the world, is bearing upon its tree the chaos and unrest of the present day. What then shall we do? We shall call under the powers of the heavens that they may be shaken, to convey to mankind that the only wisdom that is worth preserving is the understanding of purpose, and the correct use of purpose. Men must understand how to use life. They must understand where life is going. Otherwise, they are merely building rings around trees. They are expanding in a limited sphere in the forest of being, and they do not see the forest for the trees, and their perspective is warped, and they live in the ducts of their own imaginings where floating gidgets of human creation move through the life stream, through the bloodstream of their manifestation. This is not cosmic purpose. It is stultification and stratification and densification and calcination. It is despair and hate and fear and darkness and shame and illusion. We come to dispel it all. We come to say, reach out now from the heart of your being by the power of the infinite mind and obtain infinite grasp. Understand that the gifts of the cosmos are yours for the asking, but you must also ask as Solomon did for the wisdom of use. Correct use must come to all, and we must this year seek to save the earth from perishing in its own densities as it wallows in its own misery. We do not enjoy the metaphor that we sometimes are called upon to convey. We do not enjoy to bring to mankind awareness of the awesome state which they are in outwardly as a result of their own misdeeds. But we are aware of the need to bring to them also a greater awe, a translating awe that will enable them to reach out into the universal majesty and understand that the power of the universe has within itself, within its own heart and grasp, the means of emancipation. And true wisdom and true understanding will convey it. And when hearts are open, and minds are open, and they understand that life will itself not perish, they shall understand that beauty and love and the character of God shall not perish from the earth. For men and women today are forging ahead through cosmic links of progress and emancipating themselves and thus providing an impetus to the world for the emancipation of the world. I say then today, together with the goddess Meru, the hour is at hand when every soul must seek to understand its goal, its cosmic purpose that unfolds a spiral net of purest gold, the consciousness of radiant wonder flowing from the heart of God, the stream of life that would then sunder all that lives beneath his rod, teaching men to rise above it, see the measure of his love, understand the passion flowing from the heart of heaven above. Won't you understand it? Won't you accept it? Won't you be free? Won't you hear and heed? For this is not a case of our begging. It is a case of our conveying. We seek to convey and we speak today that men may hear and understand and be free, that they may know, that they may see reality and find through that which they see freedom from shame and shadow, 
and an entering into the spirit of tomorrow which transcends the spirit today and brings man into the realm of the future where he can see the golden scroll of reality unfolding through society, through the ascended master realm from on high and descending as the projection of God's cosmic direction and through the soul, through the soul of the individual, gilding man with the reality that will make of him a lily that toils not, neither spins, that is arrayed in greater raiment than Solomon of old, the light of understanding from the sun, the golden flame that frees every one, the purity that enables all to run their course and to obtain freedom in this age for self and life. In God's name, I thank you. which budded is the symbol of the abundant life. I am come that ye might have life and that more abundantly is the manifestation of the love of the eternal. Break the rod from the tree Separate the life from the life. Bring it apart and dry it up, and it will still bud. For it has within its substance the inherent power of life, and that substance permeates all the cells of manifestation. When science learns to look anew behind the facade of the visible world, into the invisible world. When science learns that postulation may be real, when science realizes that the thoughts of the mind of God are the greatest potentiality that has ever existed and the root power behind evolution, they will understand how Man has interfered with the life plan of this planet and how by their misuse of creative energy in many of the epochs long past as well as in the present day in limited form, man did interfere with the plans of God to create discord, inharmony, and baneful manifestation. You have looked at the biting and stinging insects with regret and have said, why did God make them? He did not, for they were created through misqualification of energy by man's thoughts and feelings flowing forth in an ungoverned manner. But as I come to you today, it is to restore to nature 
the bounty of the abundant life. I say then, with the power from on high, with the power that shakes the heavens, with the power that vibrates through the entire planetary body with the sounding. Nature, raise your head. Let the bow that has been bowed down by negative energy now be unleashed and let nature raise her head. Let the fresh boughs of springtime laden with the promise of immortal life flow and let through nature now the manifestation of the original divine perfection flow and let us see as to whether or not the power of divine love cannot renew in men an awareness of the creative principle that dormant in the universe may seem to be dark and silent, but active in the universe is light and air and floral scent and prayer rising up with gratitude everywhere. I am come then as the sea coming in at full tide to carry to mankind some sense of renewed awareness of the impending release of divine love to the planet. This divine love is the original plan of God that in its whitened purity is the brilliance of the never failing sun from the heart of the universe. God proposed and created beauty and perfection in an unlimited manner. Man has done as they will with mortal substance. And behold, their error lies broken at their feet. Broken lives, torn branches, the sundering of heart from heart, the division of mankind into myriad nations and sects and confusions, all of which have themselves created further discord upon the planetary body and have bowed nature down most heavily. Then, too, the lifespan of mankind prior to this present time gradually diminished from its original point until men lived in the norm but a span of 25 to 35 years. Now, through science, we have extended a bit beyond the three score and ten, but the abundant life is not the life of flesh and blood. It is the life of the spirit. It is the life of the Christos. It is the life eternal and abundant which lives in every flower and welds to gather the tangled threads of the universe into one conglomerate mass of cosmic beauty and ethereal wonder which every soul that inhabits is grateful for. We say then that a coodle has been granted to mankind a little look whereby they have seen a fragment of the divine radiance and their hearts have been sundered. They have said, we can take no more the beauty, the glory, the wonder, the flow, the love that we feel is enough to crack the shell of our very being. And it is so, for as an egg, as Humpty Dumpty, they are indeed dashed in pieces by the power of the transcendent light of God, especially when they are not prepared to receive it. But the Lord of hosts is his name, the Lord God of hosts, the mighty I am presence, the being of man, the being of God, the being of all. And so as I come to you today, it is to remind you that regardless of the appearances in the world of form, the love of God that desired abundant life for all remains active in the world and flows out to those who are able to receive him. To those who sit in darkness that see not the light, Behold, 
It is as though nothing has passed by. Their hearts are not stirred and the breeze is passed. The breeze becomes a hurricane and they move not. They are as dead men and as dead men's bones. They live not in the sense of reality, but in temporal passing pleasures and the shades of the senses have kept them in the dark. And the sunlight of God's love has not warmed them, has not revivified them, and has not moved upon them, for they are not moved. And because they are not moved, because there is no response, because no response has been evoked from the Most High, they are indeed dead. And although they seem to live and move and pantomime and function as puppets upon a stage, pulled by their desires and the threads of their fashions, they will come to naught and be no more. And the power of animation will forsake them utterly, and they will find themselves in the netherworld of their own creation, and they will face the sad ghosts of their own longings and desires, wandering thither and yon in an empty universe where reality is not, for reality has fled. But simultaneously, coexisting in the land of the blessed will be the realm of light and the realm of power and the realm of the grace of God, the realm of healing energy, the realm where the mind comes awake, the realm where God dwells and communes, the realm where the fashion of beauty and noblesse oblige lives and breathes. Yea, this is the realm that you see and glimpse in the flashes of genius of your great artists, your great men, many of whom you have crucified either openly or by reason of failure to understand that which they seek to convey. Michelangelo, Titian, and a host of others have spoken to the world. They have spoken to the world, and they have brought and wrought in the world the face of Venus. But men have seen it not. They have sought to adorn their homes of wealth and distinction with these renderings, but they have only served to rend themselves still further because they do not understand as dumb beasts the culture that is conveyed by the master's hand. All lovely things, whether of floral beauty or crystal or statuary alabaster gleams, every creation, even the fragmentary creation of great sonatas of music rending the ear and delighting the heart, all are the manifestation of the realm of the angels, the realm of the invisible, the soundless sound that is born from heart to heart and communicates to all a start of their own divinity. To unravel the thread of that divinity is to follow that thread of light through the labyrinth of life until man comes face to face with the original divine image of himself, his own beloved I am presence, and the silver cord must be followed back to the source, and the treasures of heaven become for all reality, 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 splendid reality. The world loves to do two things, beloved one. They love to make and they love to break the idols of the mart. They love to make and create those persons whom they can look to for deliverance, they long then to take and break those whom they have made and cast them down by the silly tongue of slander and human viciousness. And it shall surely come to pass, saith the Lord God of hosts, it shall surely come to pass, saith the Lord, that at their own doorstep shall fall the broken images of themselves. For they that have sought to sunder reality and divinity from others and have not held the immaculate concept, they shall find that they shall reap as they have sown by the tongue of slander and ugliness. 
And behold, I will raise up the fragmented images of those that they have sought to slay. And I will recompose them, saith the Lord. And it shall come to pass that the image that I shall fashion shall be most wondrous. And they shall see this thing of great beauty that I have done. And it shall come to pass that their hearts in the purgatory of unhappiness shall stand far off and see the beauty I have created. And they shall say, how can it be? Yes, how can it be? I Cuzco say, how can it be? Because the Lord God looketh upon the hearts and the motives, not upon the outer appearance world, nor does he seek to pierce the veil of Maya and find behind that veil some condition which is merely a fabrication of the networks of the mind. God sees what is, what is real. He sees truth. And he sees the motives of truth, that even those who possess the power to see the human aura do not always see. And therefore, men do well to reserve judgment in all things and to understand that they can, with full heart of divine love, send out love to the lepers, send out love to the sinners, send out love to the frail, and to all whom God has created that may not always seem to manifest his love and beauty. These are they who need and require God's love. These are they who need and require your love. Do you think that the strong and the mighty and the powerful and those who are recognized by men need your support? These have the support of the outer world. Those who need your support are those who are the targets of men's vicious attacks, those whose hearts have turned to the light to serve the holy cause of freedom in this age. They are the children of the dawn of the sun, recognized by heaven, but often despised while they live by earth, only to be deified after their thoughts and ideas can be themselves slanderously misinterpreted. We say then, let all men understand, let all men recognize that the power and passion of nature is building, building, building this day as I am speaking, and nature is trembling as she readies herself to release the power of divine love into the world of form. And as Ramu long ago warned, ages past, saying, behold, it shall come to pass that great destruction shall be upon the earth so do the lords of karma today warn this age that the time is coming when the accrued karma must itself be dispersed and nature must shrug. And when it occurs, great destruction will come unless the law can be comprehended and the new age be commenced. For the children of the new age, the children of the dawn, these are the Christ hope of the ages those in whom the Christ finds homage and home. And they are the ones to whom is entrusted the foci of light to plant the torch of beauty upon the planet and carry it with them about wheresoever they go. And as the wind they go, they go here and they go there. And behold, by their prayers and efforts, the world is blessed. Even the flowers take on new life. The skies become bluer the radiance of the grass greener, the sun more mellow, and the hearts of all become chastened by the infinite love of God, chastening and spurring men to understand more of the sublime reality that they are, that man is. For all shall know me from the least unto the greatest, saith the Lord God. All shall know me from the least unto the greatest. And where are the mighty? Where are those who have exalted themselves? Where are those who spiritually have proclaimed their greatness to men? Where are they indeed? Those who assert themselves to the heavens, they shall be brought down trembling to the earth, and they shall see indeed that they have become a thing of frail flesh because they have not obeyed the golden rule. The golden rule do unto others as you would have them do unto you. 
Saint Germain has built in this age again and again. He has promoted through various individuals upon the planetary body seeds of great light, and they have been planted, and behold, the little flower has come forth, and it has been nourished by God. Angels have ministered to it, ascended masters have spoken through it, and behold, it has grown up a precious thing, and men have come from afar, and they have seen its beauty, and they have drunk of the essence of its release. And then come the spoilers. They come with their sprays and their poisons, and they come with their concepts and their darkness, and they hover over it, and they drip the oil and the goo of their temporary adulation, and then soon the little flower begins to wilt and to fade, and behold, it is no more. Again and again we have seen this occur even in the past few decades, and we have watched as every subtle invisible power has sought to trample upon the plans of God by exalting the ego of mankind and telling them that surely they will find some method of deliverance through the hand of some great yogi coming from afar. They have played into the world through the systems of the world's media, the trumpeting of these deliverers, when the Christ lives within all. And whereas there is within the systems of yoga certain inherent and beautiful ideas, these are old and have been well understood by sages for centuries, and they cannot proclaim the newness of ideas which this age requires as the freshness of a spring bouquet to exalt the mind and show that by a sense of beauty that is within man has conveyed to him some of the reality of God that comes upon the altars of heaven where every moment is as the rising of the dawn and the freshness of spring. For he is eternal and from him springs the great eternal spring and it flows and it is mellow, and it is beauty in flow, and beauty in power, and beauty translated into love. Now, may I say to you that love has the greatest measure and power within it of all of the qualities of God, but few understand love and few express it. That which is expressed and called love by many is only affection for the self. That which men call love is affection for the self as the instrument of love. Men love themselves and therefore they love to be thought of as the dispensers of love. And the love that they give is a sickly unreality and they know it not which is more sickly still. And so, by my words, I seek to cauterize not only the students, but the world. And I seek to cauterize the world by saying that love is the fullness of all things lovely. And all things lovely are the thoughts of God for the world. And the thoughts of God for the world must dwell in the lover. And if the thoughts of God for the world do not dwell in you, and you act yet from the motivation of self-aggrandizement, you are of all men most miserable because you pretend to be that which you are not. And this also has its own special brand of karma and exposure. And those who do this will surely expose themselves ultimately to mankind and they will be as broken things that even God could not play with in his infancy. I say to you then, in the name of the eternal God, awake to the reality of universal love. Universal love is beauty. Universal love is power. And there is a juncture, a junction box, a place of transmutation, an altar of reality where love suddenly becomes all things. Love becomes the impetus of reality. Love becomes the power and molding factor in genius. Love becomes the radiance. Love becomes the energy. Love becomes the action. Love becomes the Christ. Love becomes light. Love becomes the universe. Love bursts into the heart as song. And love lingers forever. 
Its fragrance goes not out because it is immortal. Love is the fulfilling of all things, and love is that which I am, and love is that which you will be when you understand the frailty of the senses and the self, and you recognize and see that this is that which you must repudiate if you are to live as the Christ would live and be as the Christ is. Behold, then, love cometh, and love exalteth, and love in nature expresses. And love is even the fulfilling of the law. And when the chastening of God is manifest in outer nature, it is because love is throwing off the imposition of malignant forces and determining that the beauty which heaven desires to see manifest upon the planetary body shall function. And all of the poison of man's thoughts and his sprays and his misuse of chemicalization will be changed and man will understand that from within, not from without, cometh the beauty that is of the soul. And so transportation and transmutation will become as one. Men will be transmuted and transported from the world of the senses and the dullness of frustration and the lingering passions that they have for self-exaltation to a place where they see and perceive that all are exalted together and that when the universe comes together as a thread of light, bonds each one to the universal radiance of the day star, behold, there is a song that goeth forth, and its song is named love, and men have never known it. Only the exalted Eretz, only the exalted sons of heaven have known it, only the Christ and the God has known it, and men have talked about it, and they have misused it. Sometimes they say to one another, that individual is not functioning by divine love when the individual is functioning by divine grace and divine law and by divine love. And in their rebuke, they are bringing forth the pruning that the spirit and the individual requires. Let men then take heed that they understand that love will knead you and pummel you and beat you, that love will thoroughly shake you and make you to quake and that love will bring to you the fear of God that is the beginning of wisdom. For when wisdom has done her perfect work, then men will give forth the love of reality, and the love they give forth will be reality, and they will love, and the flame of that love in their heart will expand, and it will expand, and it will expand, and it will expand, it will expand until the world will know God, each one, even as God knoweth man, not after the flesh, but after the spirit of perfection in which he created them. May I convey from the depth of my heart, in the name of the great white brotherhood, the will of the Logos, may I convey our desire to see the summit lighthouse expand the light as I have outlined here, to stand against the assaults of mortal frailties, to hold itself aloof from enmeshment in the fury tides of the world, and to understand its mission must be fulfilled. The mission must be fulfilled because it is a link with hierarchy. This day it is a link. Let it remain so because you love it to be so, because you are not afraid to espouse a cause, because you are not afraid to understand that when you give your all to this light, you are not giving it unto mortal men, but unto heaven's causes for the planet. And the planet is the benefactor, and God wills it so. I thank
fragrance of holy wisdom permeates the atmosphere. The consciousness is exalted for the knowledge of the infinite conveys upon man the stairways, the steps that lead upward out of the delusions and maic conditions of the world. The world today is no different in many ways than it was in past eras of history. Beloved ones, the darkness of the world today is also the darkness of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities of the plain, and of times ruled over in the masses by those black magicians who sought to strip the world of its glory even as men today would through poisonous sprays against various insects dry up and wither the tender blossoms growing in the field. The souls of men emit a fragrance for the souls of men are the plastic recording substance upon which the life experiences of beauty and joy were intended to be inscribed. Because men with the stylus of their attention have cut erroneous patterns and aborted chippings upon the substance of the soul, Drawing vignettes of pain and despair does not mean that this is the will of God. Therefore I say to you all today, the purity of the divine intent must be recovered by everyone through acceptance of the potential of the divine within themselves. The black magicians of the world continue to ply their trade and why do they do it? Simply because they have learned to manipulate power for themselves. Those laws which God has placed in the world of form and made available to mankind for their salvation, laws of visualization governing the freedom of man, stairways to the stars, have been used by the black magicians to control segments of the population, to spew out into the atmosphere the very wrong ideas which they seek to convey. Media then, that is telepathic media and the power of thought transference of energy fields is in itself no more wrong or deceptive than a motion picture screen or an artist's easel and canvas. For these things in themselves are harmless. They come from the field and forest, from elementals, from nature, from the borders of the kingdom of God. But it is the use which people make of them that is ruinous. For example, the power to convey thought from one place to another is used by the brothers at Kashmir to send hope to the dying, to send the vibratory action of infinite love across space, annihilating space as though it did not exist and bringing to those distant ones from our temples the immediacy of our love. This love poured out then upon them conveys the grace of God. Is the solar radiance less because it comes through the far reaches of space? Is the light of a star less because it travels long to journey to the world? It still twinkles hope to the eyes of a child and speaks of distant worlds. But 
When we consider the transference of thoughts and ideas across space, we must cognize that this is not only the forte of the advanced, of the spiritual master, of the holy ones, but it is also the possibility of every soul who desires to use it for evil, for wrong thoughts, and for the manifestation of evil patterns. These individuals then, who have become black magicians, are those who have recognized the joy and the throb of joy that fills their being as they are able to manipulate power. Can thought be transferred? Then they can transfer it. Because their nature itself is not divine, they cannot communicate divine love, and therefore they give the aborted power structure of their consciousness to others. They convey to others the power of hypnotism, the power of manipulation, the power of the hex and counter hex, the power of the spell and the counter spell, and the world is placed in a kettle of soup, for the world becomes a land where witches function and witchcraft and variance and strife and human emotions invades the realm of the cosmos, utilizing the airwaves of the spirit to pour the poisonous brew of hate and hate creations and control and manipulation over mankind. This is what is occurring today as it did in days of old in the world. The black magicians understanding that they have flung away their divine opportunities and having no love for the grace of God, feel that all that they then have left is the self and its tenure. They determine then to do all that they can in the short space of time allotted to them. This is spoken of in your own book of Revelation, saying the devil has come down unto you having great wrath for he knoweth that his time is short. Let men understand then that these beings, possessing some native intelligence, certainly, and a considerable knowledge of how to manipulate force and energy, are able to recognize that they can affect life from one place to another. It does not take long for a child, blessed ones, to learn that by the stormy silence of his mouth he can influence individuals and by pouring out vituperation and hatred through the spaces of his silence, he can sometimes affect people far more than by loud outcry. We call this to your attention to show you that at a very early age, individuals learn the manipulation of others by feelings and by expressing ideas. The black magicians are no different than ordinary mortals insofar as as their vituperativeness is concerned, insofar as their desire to express their ego. And in one very real sense, they do actually compete with one another to see who can produce the greatest evil. This, of course, to you who are engrossed in the Father's business seems somewhat horrible. But let me remind you this day that those that are following the Ascended Masters also have a strong desire to excel in rendering good service. Therefore, it is not too strange that these individuals shall compete to exceed in the business of doing evil. We cite these things not to bring fear into the realm of mankind or to bring discouragement to you, but to bring awareness and protection and strength and assistance to mankind. For today, there are probably 18% more black magicians functioning in the world than a year ago. And I cite this to show you that in man's struggles for realization, so many of them have contacted the black arts, the occult, and some type of subconscious control that without realizing it, many of them are being led by the competitive sense into an activity of 
enmeshment in black magic. Unfortunately, many of those individuals feel that they are only exercising a form of mind control over life and life circumstances. They do not understand that there are very delicate laws governing cosmos and governing the interpersonal relationships between people. We then today wish to extend to you all our assistance by this address that you will recognize the need to expand the Ascended Master's light activities as a countermeasure calculated to assist the people of this planet in finding their freedom from these binding conditions. For certainly you must know and realize, beloved ones, that among the intelligentsia of the earth, various forms of personal control by individuals are used. I wish to call to your attention that many big businessmen today have various methods whereby they control or seek to control their competitors or those who call upon them, and they wish to avoid that those individuals should waste their time, and therefore they have systems of control whereby their secretaries can be called and the individuals ushered quickly out of their offices. You will understand, because man continually seeks to control other men, that this is a normal procedure in the world. It is not so dangerous used outwardly as it is dangerous when it is used inwardly. For then individuals functioning through the power of the mind and spirit are able to reach into people's consciousness while they sleep at night and plant seeds of darkness. Let every student of the light then understand why Jesus made the statement of old, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. There should be no harboring of outer conditions of ill will in your consciousness as you pass into sleep. For when you do so, you affinitize yourself with the dark forces and enable them to manipulate the doorway to consciousness and plant in your consciousness those qualities which you would never in your waking self desire to express. Many times individuals say to themselves, I do not know why I did this or why I did that. Certainly it is not like me. Well, blessed ones, I assure you that it is not like you, certainly not like your divine self or like the patterns you have espoused. But when individuals, without realizing it, open the door to these subtle and hidden forces and these forces come into consciousness, they can play upon areas of your being that remain untransmuted from subterranean levels and bring them toward the surface and cause you to wish to do or to do things that you would ordinarily never do. There is always a mixture of bane and blessing in this, for even when the dark forces do this, they have a tendency to create the surfacing of this subconscious untransmuted substance. And so the alert chila will see it and seize upon it as an opportunity for transmutation and a recognition that he has more work to do upon himself. Be it so, I still would prefer that transmutation occur the right and proper way because the eye of God through the consciousness has enabled the individual to see deeply within to the recesses of themselves and to pour down a ray of such God concentration, energy and love as to ferret out all undesirable qualities from deep within and purify them by the never failing light of God. But I call all these things to your attention today in order that you may be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. For let the world continue its nefarious attitudes and acts. Let the black magicians continually seek to ply their trade. They will one day be no more, and the children of the light will shine as the sun in their father's kingdom. And the sun by which they will shine is the sun of illumination which illumines the acts of men and shows them how they ought to walk in following the Christ in the regeneration. Today, many young people are being caught in the lure of black magic, witchcraft, and various other manipulative functions, making use of hidden energy wells within the consciousness and being of man. Our students are fortunate indeed, the students of the Ascended Masters, to have the knowledge of this 
and to understand it. For many are the nets released in books and periodicals as a deluge upon mankind, seeking to show them how they can have all of their desires and wishes fulfilled simply by reading a little simple instruction. Gracious ones, if it were so easy for men and women to escape from the bondage which they find themselves in, do you not think that the Ascended Masters would long ago in their great love and greater wisdom have conveyed all of these things to mankind? Do you not think that we would long ago have given this instruction to your hand and heart? We want to point out that the way may seem long and arduous, but it really is not when viewed from the total span of your being. For many of you have been upon this planet from as much as 20,000 to 80,000 years and do not realize it. I want to point out to you then that if in a short span of 10 or 20 or 30 years or even 33 years you are able to effect your release from all of the accrued negative ideas of centuries of living and to enter into the great God control of your life and the surrender of yourself to the great universal life plan, you are indeed accomplishing much in a very short space of time. And I think it is very marvelous how the power of holy wisdom conveys to men the means whereby they can effect their release from sense and sense delusions and find their way back to the heart of God. We know that through religious exercises and performances of service to mankind in past lives, when your understanding was far less than it is today, you certainly did build up a great deal of karma of a benign order that has kept you on the path and provided you with great untold assistance today. But this is an entirely different situation than walking in the light of knowledge where you actually have the knowledge of what you ought to do and then are able to do it. We call to your attention then how that in the days ahead this challenging year should be utilized as no other year has ever been as a means to have that full faith in the light of God and holy wisdom that will enable you to intensify the power of your love, intensify the power of your faith, intensify the power of hope, intensify the power of intensifying. Yes, intensify the power of intensifying so that you can actually square it and create a greater focus, a greater torch to cut yourselves free from all that is dark and brings despair to the hearts of men. You must become torches in the world to cut others free. Wherever you walk, you must actually carry the light of God that is the light of freedom to men. But you must not be content to disseminate that light merely where you are physically. You must recognize that you have the power far greater than these black magicians, if you will only use it, to reach out and to counteract with full power and full energy those thoughts and feelings that those individuals are putting out into the atmosphere. Let them put out hate. You must put out love. Let them put out despair. You must put out hope. Let them put out darkness. You must put out light. Let them put out thorns. You must put out roses. Let them put out dark clouds. You must put out blue skies and singing birds. Everything that mankind who are of the order of the dark put out that is negative and deceitful and destructive in the mental belt must be counteracted by the students of the light as they adhere to the thoughts of God, the thoughts of Christ, the thoughts of radiant energy that pour from the great central sun and understand that there is a reason why today we are able to heal the sick from a distance, to perform miracles from a distance because we have used our energy in full faith for the glory of God and the unfoldment of the sons of heaven upon this planetary body. Will you go and do likewise? Will you take a page from our book? Will you write that page down carefully in your hearts and minds and use it every day? Will you recognize how that each one of you by so doing can add to the great constructive forces of the world and raise at the time of harvest the percentages of the servants of the light so that we may make our report to the lords of karma and say, Behold! the good that has been done. Certainly more dispensation should be conveyed upon these who have done so well. 
They have used the talents that has been given unto them, and therefore let us ask for more for them, that they may expand their service to man and hasten the ultimate day when the unfailing light of God shall cause the roses of beauty to burst before the feet of all, to release into the atmosphere the perfume of achievement and harmony, and to strike those chords of celestial melody which shall blend all races, all tongues, all peoples, and all individuals into one great, beautiful, white light of cosmic achievement. The Father then will have fulfilled all, for the rainbow rays will return back to the pure white light, and God will again create and send forth according to his master plan, and you will merge with those intelligences that can and do say, let us go down and make man in our image and after our likeness. I thank you. of God abide with you always, and may his love keep you constant to the balance of his law, 